Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and good morning. I want to welcome you to Kara's Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Julianne Harris and I will be your host this morning. So let's get right into the announcements. Did you know that we have these Bible studies five days a week? So let me go over the schedule in case you're new tuning in so that you can tune in while we're live. On Mondays and Fridays, we have live Bible study at 10 a.m. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's at 6 p.m. And Wednesday morning, like this morning, is at 7 a.m and that is all mountain time. So why do I tell you the times is because we want you to tune in while we're live. So please calculate that out, tune in while we're live and why we want you to tune in while we're live is so that you can interact with us. And so how you interact with us is as you listen to the minister this morning, uh, Pastor Rick McFarland, you're gonna have questions that enter into your mind. And so we want those questions from you. So go down to the chat section of whatever forum you're watching and start typing in those questions and then about the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program we're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can also we want you to interact with us by becoming a partner uh, you can be a part of all the live content and all the material that's coming out of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College by becoming a partner so there's a couple ways you can do that is you can go to awmi.net slash give or you can give us a call at 719-635 5-1-1-1-1. And also, you know, if becoming a partner maybe seems a little daunting to you, or maybe that's just too much, just give. Um, anything helps uh, take this message across the globe as this ministry is doing, and you can be a part of it. Also, at that phone number, we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So no matter what time you're watching this program, we want to pray with you. And so you don't need to be going through something alone. You know, we understand that this world is a little crazy right now. And we, but we, uh, as believers, we have the word of God. We have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwelling on the inside of us. And so we want to couple our faith with you, hook up with you in faith and watch God do amazing things in your life. So if you're going, if you uh, want that, <laughs> give us a call at 719-635-1111. Okay, so those are all my announcements. Now I get to introduce our uh, minister this morning. His name is Rick McFarland. He is my pastor. He pastors River Rock Church in Colorado Springs, and he's amazing. He's also one of our main instructors at Karis Bible College. And so welcome, Pastor Rick. I know uh, what you're going to share this morning is going to be amazing, so let's get yeah. right into it. I'm glad to be with you. Yeah. always enjoy this. And so today I want to talk about transformation God's way. Amen. And so there's a way that the world teaches that we change, really it's just change, but God's into transformation. And so we're going to talk about God's way to see transformation. And so really that's walking in the Spirit. And so in the New Testament, you can't get very far in the New Testament when you see how important it is to walk in the Spirit. But before we actually talk about what does it mean to walk in the Spirit, I want to talk about what does it mean to be spiritual or to be carnal? Because as a Christian, you can either be spiritual or you can be carnal. I won't ask Julianne which. But <laughs> I'm totally we know spiritual. It, we know it's spiritual. I'm all spiritual. It is always spiritual. <laughs> so 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse, the first verse. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 says, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So here we see a Christian can either be spiritual or to be carnal. So what does it mean to be spiritual? It means uh, when one's spiritual, they walk in the Spirit. And so, well, that's helpful. Great. Well, what's walking in the Spirit? <laughs> well, good. we'll get there. But next it says, it, uh, you can also be carnal. And so carnal means that you're influenced in walking in the flesh. And so we see that oftentimes babies are carnal, but actually you can be saved many years and still be carnal. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about what does it mean to be spiritual. Unbelievers never called spiritual, never called carnal. They're called something else. In 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 14. What an unbeliever is called says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. 
nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So an unbeliever is not born again, not hooked up to the life of God, the Holy Spirit. And so they're just left to their natural self. And so an unbeliever is called natural. So a believer is called either spiritual or carnal because you have the Holy Spirit. We're just not yielding to it oftentimes. Amen. And so I want to talk about what does it mean? So if being spiritual means to walk in the Spirit, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, most of the time when people talk about walking in the Spirit, they go immediately to Galatians 5.16. So let's go ahead and go there as well. Galatians 5.16, it says in this verse, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. First time I read this verse, I saw hope in this verse. Yeah. I said, there's light here. <laughs> you know, because if you're a believer, you're truly born again. You don't want to walk in sin. You don't want to walk in the flesh. You want to walk in freedom. We we're born for freedom. Amen. And so here is the answer. If I'll only walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I was, got real excited and then all of a sudden my hopes were dashed because Paul doesn't tell us what it means. Yeah. He doesn't explain how to do it, doesn't tell what it is. And so I, there's been times I was so frustrated, I want to climb up into heaven, find Paul, grab him by the robe collar, shake him and say, Paul, <laughs> you told me the answer to my problem, but didn't tell me how to do it. What does it mean? <laughs> And so I can almost see Paul uh, unprying my fingers off his robe and <laughs> saying, well, Rick, I, you know, I didn't tell you how to do it in the book of Galatians, but I did tell you in the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. And so the book of Romans is the foundational book of the New Testament. It's the first epistle, the first letter to the church. And so Romans is like the book of Genesis that has the, the seedbed of every doctrine you're going to find the rest of, of the New Testament. You're going to find it first mentioned in Romans. And so if you understand what it's being said in Romans, you can understand plug it in where you see it elsewhere. That's the way it is with walking in the Spirit. So the first instance of walking in the Spirit Paul mentions is in Romans chapter 8 verse 4. But before we get there I want to see actually you need to understand Romans 7 before we can really understand Romans 8. And Romans 7 really talks about a believer's struggle in the flesh trying to overcome their flesh by willpower. That's what most Christians are trying to do. They're trying to overcome sin, overcome a habit, an addiction mm -hmm. by willpower. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work. It may work for a little bit. You know, you go on that diet. It works the first day or two, and then all of a sudden the pie overcomes. And you eat <laughs> it's an entire pie, right? <laughs> and, so, and so let's look at Romans chapter 7. I'm going to see Paul left us a personal testimony of his struggle being carnal. Mm. Being, a, being a Christian, trying to overcome his own flesh by his willpower. And so I look, look at Romans 7, look at verse 14. And so, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. How do we know Paul's a believer here? Because he used the word carnal. An unbeliever is never called carnal, he's called the natural man. Paul says, I'm being carnal here, and he's going to give a testimony. I'm glad in 11 verses, Paul leaves a personal testimony of, of a struggle in the flesh that he doesn't, he can't win. We're going to find out he leaves many clues to what his problem is and how he got out of it. And so, Julian, I need your help. And as okay. we read through these verses, I want you, every time I say the word I, okay. I need it to count. Okay. And so, we're going we're gonna to read this testimony of his struggle in the flesh. We're going to find out he had, what his problem was. So, Romans 7. 715 says, for what I One, am doing, I two, do not understand for what I three, will to do that I four, do not practice, but what I five, hate that I do. Six, if then I seven, do what I eight, will not to do, I nine, agree with the law that is good. But now it's no longer I ten, who do it, but sin that dwells in me. But for I 11, know that's in me, that is in my flesh, nothing dwells good. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I 12, do not find. For the good that I 13, will to do, I 14, do not do, but the evil I 15, will not do. To do that, I <laughs> practice. But if I do, what I 18, will not to do. This is no longer I 19, to do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find 20, then a law that is evil is present with me. But the one who wills to do good, for I 21, delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I 22, see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank 24. God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in this personal testimony, we see it going, it's kind of hard. That was a lot. You know, being carnal is very complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated. You're going round, it seems like you're going round yes. and round on a treadmill and yeah. you're never getting anywhere. It's so true. That's the way it is. You, you're trying, you think you got yourself under control. Nope, I don't. 
And so it's very complicated. It's almost a tongue twister. I believe he put that on purpose. It's just so com complex. And so, but, but what was his problem? We found 24 times Paul uses the word I. Mm -hmm. What was Paul's problem? He had eye disease. <laughs> Not physical eye disease. He had the letter I. I. See, Paul had his eyes on himself. He was a navel gazer. Yes. And so when you have your eyes on you, you're a navel gazer. And so uh, there's the answer of salvation never has been in you. The day you got born again, you had your eyes on Jesus. Amen. By faith, received salvation and, and was taken from darkness to light. But then afterwards, we get back into legalism, get our back eyes on what we do, and we try to be our own Savior after that. Yeah. And no, you need Jesus just as much as you need now. And so Paul tried harder, as hard as he could. Everything he learned, he used as a tool. How I can use that to fix myself. And, and Paul realized after a while, he put up the white flag. And in verse 24, he put up the white flag. The worst day Paul realized, he thought it was his worst day, that he finally gave up. He was a total failure in trying to be a Christian in his own energy, in his own willpower. He put up a white flag, but that was his best day. But in, in Romans 7, 24, it says, O wretched man that I am, <clears throat> he asked a wonderful question, who will deliver me? Up until that time, he said, the question was, what do I need to do to deliver myself? Yeah. What can I do? I can, I can try to fix myself. But Paul says, I find I realized he looked up and away from himself and he says, who's going to be my deliverer? And for the first time he looked up and saw Jesus again. Amen. And Jesus was his answer. Verse 25, after <clears throat> 11 verses of, all, uh, of a problem, he finds actually in verse 25 how simple the answer is. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. He was my answer to get me saved, but he's my answer now that's going to deliver me from sin in my life. And so Paul uses the word I 24 times, but just looks at Jesus and finds victory. Mm -hmm. Then he goes into Romans 8. This is the life of the Spirit. This is the life of victory for a Christian. And so what's the first thing Paul found when he got his eyes off himself, stopped being a navel gazer, and got, an eyes, on, got his eyes on Jesus and became a sun gazer? S-O-N. He got it on the Son of God and got his eyes on Jesus. The first thing he found himself getting free from was condemnation. Yes. Romans 8, 1 says, therefore there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When you walk in the Spirit, you have your eyes on Jesus. When you have your eyes on Jesus, you realize what He's did for you. He is your sacrifice. He is your payment of sin. And you can find yourself free from condemnation. But I guarantee if you get your eyes on you and try to overcome in your own willpower and try to be your own Savior, you're going to fail over and over again. And all you're going to see is your failures. You're going to see your sin. You're going to get into condemnation. Let me say this. The pit that navel gazers are destined to fall into is condemnation. Mm -hmm. And guilt and condemnation. Yeah. So the first thing, the life of the Spirit, is you get your eyes on Jesus and you get free from condemnation. Yeah. But let's actually see the first time that we see that walking in the Spirit's mentioned. And so I want you to look at Romans 8, 4. Uh, or, sorry, Romans 8, 5. It says, for those who live, uh, live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Actually, verse 4 talks about walking according to the Spirit in Romans 8, 4. But in Romans 8, 5, it, just, it, it talks about what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Paul gives the first definition of walking in the Spirit. He says, for those who live or walk according to the Spirit, to the flesh, set their minds on the flesh, but those who live or walk according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So, according to Paul, what does it mean to walk or live in the Spirit? It means to set your mind yes. on the things of the Spirit. This brings out the fact that walking in the Spirit is a mindset. Mm. It's a mindset. Where's your mindset? Walking in the flesh or being carnal is a mindset. Yeah. Being spiritual or walking in the Spirit is a mindset. And so, what does it mean to be spiritual? You set your mind on the things of the Spirit. What does it mean to be carnal? Set your mind on the things of the flesh. Just your circumstances, just yourself, and get your eyes in the natural. That's to being carnal. And so, again, being carnal is a mindset. Being spiritual is a mindset. I have good news for you. You can be carnal one moment, and you can change to be spiritual the next moment. See, yeah. I always thought to become spiritual, I had it was a long process of maturity. No. That I had to graduate three years of Karis Bible College. <laughs> I could eventually get stop from being carnal and be spiritual. Amen. But Paul brings out that it's a mindset. Yeah. So if your mind's set on the flesh in a moment, you can set your mind on the spirit. Amen. And you can go from being carnal to being spiritual in a moment. That's Hallelujah. great news. Yeah, it is. But there's some bad news. Uh -oh. You can be spiritual one moment and become carnal the next moment. <laughs> well, carnals, no. you all get out. 
<laughs> get your mind set on your problem. Get your set on what sister bucket mouth or brother flip a lip or whatever they say. <clears throat> All of a sudden you so are true. carnal in a moment. Yeah, it's true. And so again, it's setting your mind. And so let's plug the, de if the definition of walking in the spirit means to set your mind on the things of the spirit, you can translate Galatians 5, 16 as if you set your mind on the things of the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. And so that begs the question, if we're to set our mind on the things of the spirit, that's what walking in the spirit is. Well, what are the things of the spirit? Yeah. That's a good question. Well, it's what's true in the spirit realm. Because yeah. there's a whole other realm besides the natural realm that is more, uh, more permanent than this realm. This realm is, is, is temporary, it's changeable, but the spirit realm is eternal and unchanging. And so what's true in the spirit realm? What's, what's in, what are some of the things in the spirit realm? Well, angels. Mm. You know, I brought mine today. It's a big ghetto angel dude behind me. <laughs> I don't have a little guy in a diaper. All know. right. <laughs> so, so I have, you know, angels are, are, are in the spirit. Your born again spirit is in the spirit. Amen. So what's true in your born again spirit is one of the things of the spirit. And that, but the resurrected Jesus Christ, he is in the spirit. He's seated at the right hand of the father. Yeah. And we're going to find out that is where we're to set our mind to walk in the spirit. In Colossians, look at verse uh, chapter three, look at verse one and verse two, Colossians three, one and two. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Amen. Well, what things that are above? The things on the roof? No, no. They're talking about <laughs> spiritually in the spirit realm. Seek those things which are above in the spirit realm where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse two, look at verse two, set your mind. Mm -hmm. Set your mind, does that, does that ring a bell of what we just talked about? That the definition Paul gave in Romans eight, four and five is to walk in the spirit means to live or walk in the spirit is to set your mind on the things of the spirit, the things that are above. And so set your mind on things above, not the things on the earth. So let's talk about, so Paul is talking about walking in the spirit in this verse because he doesn't use that term, but he uses the definition of it yeah. that he used in the book of Romans. And so again, that's walking in the spirit. This is even seen as a principle that you could have walked in in the Old Testament. Look in Isaiah 26, verse three. I love this verse. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26, look at verse three. says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Would you like to have perfect peace today? Yes. But uh, in the Hebrew, actually, uh, it says shalom, shalom. Mm. Well, the translator didn't know how to translate shalom, shalom, so they said perfect peace. Uh, shalom means perfect soundness, wholeness, safety, preservation, prosperity. It was really the, the, the uh, package of salvation. Uh, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So, so if you're going to walk in the spirit, you need to keep your mind set on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if I, if you'll look through the looking glass of the word of God and behold Jesus just as he is in his resurrection and his glory. And if you behold Jesus today, I can't explain it by beholding him. Power flows from him through the Holy Spirit up through your spirit into your soul. And it will dominate your flesh. Amen. It will dominate your natural. And so it's by the power of the spirit, not by willpower. You were never called to live by willpower, but by spirit power. And so when you get your eyes on Jesus, I can't explain it, but I just know it's true. When you look at Jesus, power in life flows from him and it will dominate your natural. And so how do you know you're walking in the spirit? So verse five talks about setting your mind on the things of the spirit. That's the definition of it. But how do you know you're doing it? Look at Romans 8, 6. Romans 8, 6 tells you how you know you're doing it, when you know you're doing it. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so if you're walking in the spirit, have your eyes on the, set on the things of the spirit, then you're going to have life and peace. That's Amen. the only thing you're going to have. Amen. But if your life, if your focus is set on you, your problems, what people have said, the things around you, just the natural, that's going to produce death, toxic emotions that produces death. And so I'm going to talk about that God has given you a switch that's going to turn the spiritual light on or turn the dark or turn it off. And so again, your mind, actually your mind is the switch that God's given to you. So if you're going to walk in the spirit, it's going to be with a mindset. And so let me say this, let's say this, my, that my mind is a, is a light switch today. And so if my light, if a light switch off, it's turned off. And it's, and so when I'm looking down at myself, I'm a navel gazer, I'm focusing on me trying to be my own savior, trying to overcome myself. And, and I'm, and I'm just focused on me. Then the switch is off. 
and the flow of the Spirit's not going to flow. Yeah. But if I'll flip the switch and I'll look up and through the looking glass of the Word of God and behold Jesus and the things of the Spirit, all of a sudden I turn the light on. It's a spirit, light always overcomes darkness. Amen. It's a spiritual law that operates when you do that. Let me talk about, just make it practical. This happens to you. You walk in the spiritual law at church. Mm -hmm. When you walk in, you go to church and you start out with praise and worship. Yeah. And when you know when you're really locked in in worship, yeah. where you're focusing on the Lord, and that's all you're not th focusing on lunch, you're not focusing on what you got to do that day. <laughs> you're focusing on, and all of a sudden you're just in there. And what are you experiencing? Your joy and peace yeah. and glory. And, and why? Because you're doing a spiritual law. Your light flips. Your your switch is flipped on. Amen. Your focus is completely on the things of the spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit's ministering up through your soul Amen. and dominating your natural. And so you have a great sermon talking about in Christ realities. You're yes. born again. You're the righteous of God. And you're like, well, I'm going to find the next devil and bust him up. Amen. But then guess what? You walk out the door and pick up the bag of troubles you came in with, pop them back so on, start true. thinking about stuff. You get in the parking lot and they cut you off or brother flip a lip, brother, you know, sister bucket mouth says something. <laughs> And all of a sudden you start and then Monday shows up and you're back at your boss. And guess what? And you're like, well, I just wish I could be in church all the time. I wish the pastor would follow me home and <laughs> preach to me. The choir would sing to me in the mornings. And, but because I can't wait till church till I can experience this high again. Well, you didn't realize you were operating a spiritual law, but then you're operating in the opposite spiritual law. You flip the switch off. So and during the week, but you can have that that uh, switch flipped all week long. Amen. And so we'll teach you practically how to do that. How about youth camp? I don't know if you've been to a youth camp, yes. but the you talk about youth. What do they do when you come to youth camp? They take their phones away. Yeah. And so instead of being Facebook, your face is in the book. Amen. So you're in Bible studies all day. They don't want to take your phone book. And so um, they take your, your phone away. And so you're in worship services. You're in the Word. And the youth, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God starts moving in them yeah. and transforming their lives. And all of a sudden, youth camp's over. And so they get their, their Facebook back. They get their phone back. They get back into school and what they're doing and the whole thing. And they get, and then they realize, you know, I can't wait to come to youth camp to have that high again yeah. to where it transformed my life. But while they were at youth camp, they had their light switch turned on. Yeah. They were operating a spiritual law and walking in the spirit. But then they flipped it back off. And so every time you've ever had peace and joy in life, you had your mind set on the things of the spirit. Every time you've been in depression, Anger, frustration, you had your eyes in the natural every single time. Yeah. It's a law. And so, again, you can do something about what you're experiencing. I want to talk about overcoming spiritual rats. A spiritual rat. You know, people don't <laughs> like rats. Well, mice are cute, but maybe, but a rat. You know? Oh, no. Rats are the big, ugly ones, right? <laughs> and so, but what's a spiritual rat? That's, that's sin, that's addictions, that's, uh, frust that's just the negative stuff of the flesh. I want to talk about how do you overcome that? Look in Colossians 3, 5. They're going to list some spiritual rats uh -oh. in this verse. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 5 says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Here's some rats that, that, that are in a lot of believers' lives they struggle with. Fornication, that, that's sex outside of, uh, you know, you're not married and, and you're having sex with someone you're not married to. Uncleanness, passions, evil passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. So here's some things people struggle with. And you know, if you try to overcome these things with willpower, you'll fail. Yeah. And all they do, they get, they just get meaner and bigger and nastier. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? But, but Paul in Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death your members. You're like, well, I try. I'm going to try to put them to death. But, but notice the word therefore. You don't just sentence, start a sentence with therefore. When you see the word therefore, ask, what is it therefore? Right. It's based on what was said before. And remember yeah. what Colossians 3, 1 and 2 said? It says, seek those things which are above, set your mind on things above. And when you do that, that is how you're going to put to death these, these rats. Mm. Is by whenever I can't, is, it, it, I can't explain. You just behold Jesus through the looking glass of His Word and behold Him, and power flows from Him, and He puts the rats to death. Mm. I like the story of Sir Hanley Page. You probably haven't heard of Sir Hanley. No, I have not. Well, Hanley was an early aviation pilot in in Great Britain, and uh, he tells a story that back when they were in the open cockpit, right, like right. Snoopy. 
<laughs> yes. And so he was flying one day and all of a sudden he heard some squeaking behind him. So he turned and looked back and saw a big rat had joined his, 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 uh, he was his co-pilot. Oh no. He was back there and he saw this rat and the rat was gnawing on one of the control lines of the plane. Oh no. And so they didn't have automatic pilot back then and so yeah. he couldn't get up and deal with this rat and so all of a sudden he knew what he had to do to deal with this rat so he just pulled the stick back and climbed and climbed and climbed and climbed higher and higher and higher to where he could barely breathe yeah. and all of a sudden that rat uh, squeaking stopped see that rat couldn't live in rare fair air it killed it well how are you going to deal with the spiritual rats in your life take them up higher Praise God. Get your eyes and take them to the throne of God where Jesus sits yeah. at the right hand of God and keep your focus there. And those rats will die because they can't live in the rarefied air of the Spirit of God. And so what's God's way of transformation? I'm going to talk about a verse that's the clearest verse in the New Testament on God's plan for your transformation. And it's different than what, what the world teaches. It's different than what religion teaches you. Look in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face, mm. beholding. Amen. Beholding as in a mirror. What's the mirror? The Word of God. It's the looking glass that you can look into the things of the Spirit. The Word of God is the only approved device that God's given you that you can look at any time, look at what's true in the Spirit realm. So it's beholding as in a mirror, that's the Word of God, the glory of the Lord. So what are you, so, so what are you going to see through the, what should you be looking at through the, the mirror of God's Word? The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and His glorification. In his resurrection. And that's the and the word of God is the only way you can truly see how he is right now. And so notice that we're to look at the glory of the Lord, but so many people are trying to look at the glory of themselves. Mm -hmm. They're Not navel good. gazers. No, be a sun gazer. Amen. And if you'll behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, something takes place. I can't explain it, but it's a, it's a spiritual law. Notice what you what happens when you'll do this. You are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Mm. You say, Pastor, is it that easy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that easy. That's what got you saved. You looked off from yourself and you looked at Jesus and just believed. You beheld and believed. Amen. We're to be behold Jesus and believe that as He is, so are we in this present That's world. That's it. And so it's just that simple. And you, so many religions says, no, it's so complicated. Go back to what Paul was doing. That's the way that you ought to be. You ought to be going around circles and circles and trying to use willpower and trying to, to because the world uses steps. You know, I'm just going to, I need steps to be able to attain uh, spirituality. But no, if, if you want steps to the Christian life, I'm going to give you three steps. Oh. Three steps. So write steps. it down, write it down. The first step, the first step to transformation and victory in your Christian walk, according to this verse, is look at Jesus. Amen. Okay, it gets more complicated. Okay, okay. Step number two is keep looking at Jesus. <laughs> Step number three, keep, keep on, on looking, looking at, at Jesus. Jesus. Do you God. need 12 steps? <laughs> the world teaches Amen. that you have to attain over time. Mm -hmm. No, no, if you'll just keep looking at Jesus, that transformation. But notice it says that you're transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit does the transformation. It's not you. It's not your willpower. And that's God's plan for transformation. It's not just change. Because just not where change is, if it's changed by willpower, then you're going to have to keep up the willpower. Yeah, that's it. And if you let it go anytime, it's going to come right back. But when you're transformed, it's a permanent change. And so, again, we're transformed by looking at Jesus. Finally, I'm going to look at a verse. Look at 1 John 3. Look at verse 2. 1 John 3. Look at verse 2. This principle is going to work one day when we see Jesus face to face. When we die and we, get face, we come over and we're going to see Him one day, something's going to happen when we see Him in, 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 in all of His glory, in, in uh, technicolor, exactly how He is one day when we see Him face to face. Amen. Look at 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has yet not yet been revealed what we shall be. See, we can't see who we are in the Spirit right now. We can't really see except for what the Word says about us. But it's not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He's revealed, we shall be like Him. Why should we be like Him? For we shall see Him as He is. Amen. When you see Him as He is and you behold, I can't explain it, but power flows from Him through the Spirit and transforms you into the same image.
Amen. Pastor, that's too easy. It has to be hard. I want steps. <laughs> Look at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep on looking at Jesus. <laughs> Last thing I want to talk about an example, Johnny. Uh oh. Johnny loved marbles. He was addicted to marbles. I mean, he loved playing marbles with his friends. Can't wait to get out on recess to play marbles. He loved uh, counting his marbles. He mm -hmm. loved polishing his marbles. Mm -hmm. He loved marbles. So he's playing marbles one day with his friends and some friends were playing basketball right uh, adjacent to where him and his friends were playing marbles and they were playing basketball. And one of the kids came over and said, hey, Johnny, uh, one, of our, one of our guys had to leave for lunch. Uh, can, you, can you fill in for him so we can make the full team so we can play? And Johnny says, no, I, I play marbles. I don't play basketball. He says, oh, come, Johnny, please, just, it's just for 30 minutes. He'll be back, please. And so Johnny says, okay, fine. So he got up and he filled in. And Johnny hit a couple shots. And people say, hey, Johnny, you're good. That was a great shot. And Johnny's like, yeah, maybe I am good. And so he just played another game and another game and another. But before long, he can't wait to play basketball. Everything's basketball, basketball, basketball. He plays night and noon and night. Kids are, I mean, the parents are having to call him because the, the, the lights are going out to come home to dinner. And so Johnny has Jordan posters and he wants to play college. He wants to go NBA. I mean, but, but what set him free from marbles? Basketball set him free. He was obsessed with basketball. But one day, Johnny was at, at lunch and uh, he happened to look over and he saw her. <laughs> Susie. Susie. And Susie's looking back. <laughs> so he goes over and he talks to Susie. He says, uh, Hi, Susie. <laughs> and uh, and asks, You want to do something? Uh, go out sometime? She goes, Yeah. And uh, well, when can you do it? Uh, how about Friday night? And it's like, oh, I play basketball on Fridays. Yeah. And she goes, well, if you want to see me, it's on Friday. Okay. 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 <laughs> so he, 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 he goes out with Susie. All of a sudden, he falls in love with Susie. Mm -hmm. It's Susie this and Susie that. And when he's not with her, he's thinking about her. He loves being with her. He's writing Susie, Johnny, and Susie, Johnny, and Susie. And so he just, but, but pretty soon, the friends are playing basketball. Say, Johnny, haven't seen you at the basketball. What, what are you doing? So, oh, I don't know. I just got something else. What set Johnny free from his addiction to basketball? Susie, Susie set him free. <laughs> what will set you free from the obsession of the flesh and sin and addiction? Jesus. Jesus Amen. will set you free. When you become obsessed with him, he'll set you free. Stop trying in your own energy to free yourself. And the more you focus on sin, the more sin will have power in your life. But you just get your eyes off of that and worship Jesus and he set you free. Amen. Practical ways. Let me, you know, Pastor, how, does that, how do I practically do that? How, how can I put this into practice? Well, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Let's put shoe leather to the theology. So practically, how can I walk in the Spirit? Well, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means to set my mind on the things of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Well, there's pra four disciplines that, that if you'll do, you will automatically set your mind on the things of the Spirit and see this process work. The first way you can practically walk in the Spirit is to meditate on God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. That's the mirror you're going to look through to see the Spirit. But you're going to behold look for Jesus. And John 6, 63, Jesus said, It's Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When you get into the word and look in, into the word of God, these words are spirit and life. You're going to see the things of the spirit when you meditate on the word. Next is prayer. Prayer means you automatically focus on God. You're off of you and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're seeking and focusing on God. Prayer. Philippians 4, 6 is be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And what happens when you get your attention off you and not on, not on your worries and cares and you cast your cares and turn them into prayers and you, and you focus on God and thank Him? Verse 7 says, in the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Remember, I'll, leave it, I'll put him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Amen. Here it says, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer is one of the ways that you will do this. Next of all, praise and worship is a huge way. Mm -hmm. We talk about church service where all of a sudden you're filled with joy and the glory because your mind is set on the things of the Spirit. Praise and worship. Second, Second Chronicles 5.13 says, Indeed it came to pass when the trump, this is when the dedication of the temple in the Old Testament, Indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good and His mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, that's the temple, was filled with the cloud, the Spirit of God. 
So if the Old Testament was temple was filled, well, who's the New Testament temple? You and I. Amen. If we will glorify Jesus and just focus on Him and worship Him, our temple will be filled with the Spirit. Lastly, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, being thankful. Focus, get your eyes off you and think on what He's done for you. Amen. And it, especially praying in tongues, you give thanks well. 1 Corinthians 14, 17. For indeed you give thanks well when you pray in tongues and get your mind and, and focus on the Spirit. So in closing, to be spiritual means to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit means to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And so where should, what's the things of the Spirit? Where should we set our mind? We set our mind where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. We get our eyes on Jesus. And when you do that in a very practical way throughout your day and just keep focusing on the Lord, He will transform your life. And you can't do this by willpower. You need the Holy Spirit to help you. Holy Spirit, help me. Remind me when my mind's set on the natural, which is set on the things of the flesh, the natural self, and, and help me get my mind set back on the things of the Spirit. It's a discipline. And you don't realize how undisciplined your mind is until you start in this process and making this commitment to start moving towards this way of being spiritual, is setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's there to help you and remind you to do it. And so you know how mature you are, is how, how, how much, how often do you set your mind on the things of the Spirit shows how mature you are. And how fast you are to recover yourself when it's off. Amen. And so the more mature you are, the longer you can go setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. Like Andrew, all the time. Amen. We want to shoot that, right? We yeah. want to get to where Andrew is. But, Amen. But, we're, we can, but it starts with the first step. It's a making a commitment. Today, I'm going to set my mind by, by God's grace. I'm going to get my eyes on Jesus and not get my eyes on myself. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those that are listening. I, I trust that, Holy Spirit, that you've been quickening and showing some things to people today. And Lord, that they'll put this into practice. They'll make this commitment today. Holy Spirit, help me. Set my mind on the things of the Spirit today so I can experience life and peace and I won't walk in death. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, this is powerful. And this is what happens at Karis Bible College. I just want to throw that out there because for me, it was a couple of decades of trying to modify my behavior. How'd that work? And it was terrible. It was terrible it worse, and it didn't right? work. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the Quick Christian sand. life is not just hard, it's impossible if you try to do it in and of your own strength. That's a revelation. That's the, one of the biggest revelation that a Christian can have is the yeah. Christian life is not difficult. No. The Christian life is impossible. It's impossible. Matter of fact, you were never called to live the Christian life. The only person that can live the Christian life is Jesus. Amen. And if you'll let Jesus live His life through His Spirit through you, yeah. by keeping His eyes on you and putting your trust in Him, behold and believe as He is, so am I in this present world, 1 John four seventeen. Amen. You know, and religion is, is behavior modification. Modification. And yeah. that's what I think most of us, we get born again, we experience that, oh, I'm, I'm saved. And then uh, religion comes in and says, yeah, okay, now you got to modify your behavior, basically. Yeah. But beholding Jesus is life transformation. So I'm like, it's not behavior modification, it's life transformation. That's uh, what God's When doing. I first got saved, I got my eyes on Jesus, I saw Him and was communing with Him. My life was was like transformed. The grass was greener, the sky was yeah. bluer. It was so wonderful. And then I went to church. I know, I know. And that then they said, oh, you gotta do this and you gotta do that and you gotta do right. that. You gotta do this to keep, it. and I got my eyes on me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that That's joy it. and the peace was gone That's and it. I was struggling and the more I struggled, it was like quicksand, yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper yeah. until I, I got a glimpse like Paul did of Jesus again. Amen. And he lifted me up. Yeah, amen. So you guys got great questions. I just had to uh, put my two cents worth in because <laughs> this is an amazing message. Uh, Kathy on YouTube says, and these are some questions that came in while you were still teaching, but I think this is a good question. Kathy on YouTube says, does it mean that when we walk in the spirit, but sometimes we think carnal, it's not a problem if we just switch back to walk in the spirit, not condemning ourselves, right? Right. So the first thing you do when you get your eyes back on Jesus is you're free from condemnation. Amen. You're free from guilt because he took your sin. Amen. You look at, because a lot of times we look at how bad our sin is. And if we look at Jesus and his sacrifice for us, and because his blood is in the mercy seat of heaven in heaven, it's in the spirit. He put his, his blood, his eternal blood Amen. on the mercy seat of heaven. And his blood cries out better things than that of Abel. Praise Abel God. cried out for vengeance for, for, his blood. Jesus cries out forgiveness. Amen. And when we get our eyes on the sacrifice of Jesus, we realize we're forgiven. 
that we're righteous, we're just as Jesus is in the spirit, as he is, so are we in this present world, it immediately sets us free from condemnation. So the good thing is, is you can be carnal, but you can switch in a moment by a mindset, just change. I love how you said tune in. I think we're dating ourselves. <laughs> Tuning in, I think, back when the rabbit's ears and stuff like that. Yes. But, but you can tune in on Jesus and set your mind on that channel or you can set yourself on the natural. <laughs> I never even thought of that. Okay, so guest on email says, I have been uh, learning about keeping my mind stayed on the Lord. And I find when I am doing that, all manner of thoughts try to bombard me. I know we have to cast it down, but it feels like work. And I, and if I fail, I have a feeling of shame. So does it get easier to keep the negative and worldly thoughts from coming into my mind and, and keeping my mind on him? Does it get easier? Well, we're always going to have this, this thing. As long as we have the flesh, have the so, devil, have the world, we're going to have that conflict where, oh, it's back off, yeah. put it back on. And so oftentimes we struggle with thoughts with thoughts. Mm. No, we overcome thoughts with words. Yeah, amen. And so if the enemy's harassing, we take our authority in Jesus' name and take authority, I bind that in Jesus' name. But really, I think the biggest thing about the victory of your thought life isn't trying to stop thinking things. Yeah. Have you ever tried to stop thinking something and the more you think <laughs> about it, you think about it. Don't think about the pink elephant. You're thinking pink, you're thinking elephant. Well, the only thing that's going to set you free from the pink elephant is the blue gorilla. <laughs> you need to transform, you're going to exchange it with something else. And, and so meditating the word, praise and worship, uh, prayer and thanksgiving, that automatically is going to replace that. And so again, there's no room for that. If your cup's filled, there's no full, you can't put anything else in it. Yeah. And so being filled with the spirit is keeping your mind set there. And so there's gonna be times where you're gonna be trying to pull this way or that way, but it's a process. The more you learn this as a discipline, the easier it becomes. Yeah. Matter of fact, Paul says in Hebrews, he says that when you first were enlightened, you had a great fight of affliction because your mind was so unrenewed. Mm -hmm. The more yeah. unrenewed your mind is, the more struggle you have, but the more your mind's renewed on the things of the spirit, it becomes easier and easier. Not that you'll ever on this side of the earth have to constantly deal from time to time with the enemy or your thought life. But as you, as you get more and more, it's just a default. My yeah. mind goes to the things of the spirit. Amen. That's good. Uh, Samaya on YouTube says, is there a difference between being spirit filled and, um, and having the spirit of discernment? Uh, she says, how can I discern or develop that area of my life so I can become more aware spiritually? Yeah. Well, there's no gift of discernment. As a Christian, we can discern by the Holy Spirit. Right. We have that. Uh, there's a there's a gift of discerning of spirits. Yeah. So you can discern uh, what spiritual influence is happening by that time. But a lot of times, what we call the gift of discernment is criticism. Mm. Yeah. And so we're not into that, <laughs> right? But, but you know what? Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that I I I can that I can speak in tongues. A lot of people think, well, I, you know, I've, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues or I can speak in tongues. No, being filled with the Spirit is something that is an ongoing thing. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 says, be being filled. Because a lot of people can speak in tongues, but they're empty. Yeah. And so why are we empty? Because we're, we're, our vessels are cracked. We're, we're leaky vessels. And so we need to stay, stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues, meditating the Word. Because get, how are you going to stay full of the Spirit? The very things that I, I talked about, the practical things. Meditate the Word of God. Prayer, pray, prayer, especially praying in the spirit. Amen. I, matter of fact, I did that for over an hour before we started the service, before we started this time of teaching, and I haven't ever gone an hour where I'm not filled with the peace of God. Amen. I'm not filled That's with it. strength on the inside. That's allowing the spirit of God from my spirit to fill in my soul. Amen. And so praying in the spirit, uh, meditating the word, <laughs> praise and worship, thanksgiving. Those are the things that are going to keep you. Uh, full of the spirit. Amen. And you know, Andrew has an amazing teaching. I started listening to it in 2014 when I was in Bible school and I listened to it about every single month and it's called keys to staying full Powerful. of God. And it's, it's based out of Romans chapter one. And it talks about what happened for them to, to not be full of God for their, their, uh, eyes to be darkened basically. Yeah. And it says that when they knew God, they glorified him, not as God. So we glorify God. Mm -hmm. We go this amazing thing that just happened in my life. It's glory to God. Yeah. And then it says, neither were they thankful. 
Mm -hmm. And then their imagination started working against them, and then they they were darkened. They couldn't hear the voice of God, they, yeah. and that's where a lot of us are. And so, just like you're talking about those practical things, mm -hmm. I would encourage you guys to check out uh, Keys to Staying Full of God by Andrew because it's absolutely amazing. And when we start falling into that carnality, into that focusing on the flesh, mm -hmm. uh, generally it's because we're not doing any yeah. of these things. Well, that's the downward spiral of humanity. You it know, is. but when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, it said uh, they were naked. Yeah. And, and it says that after they ate, they, they looked down and went, ah! <laughs> exactly. And then they put salad dressing on, fig leaves. <laughs> and, and so, but, but that was amazing. <laughs> that, but, but God says, who told you you were naked? That's it. They had to be told. That's it. What was it? Because they're so, their mind was so set in the spirit. Yeah. And not on the natural, that okay. the curse of the fall was self Preoccupation. Yep. Self Focus on self. Yep. And so, what 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 is what, what's going to be make heaven heaven is when we get our eyes, it'll be totally God centered in heaven. Amen. Without self preoccupation. And so, the the downward spiral of humanity is where you where you don't focus and glorify God. You don't put your attention on. Yeah. Put your attention on you, and all of a sudden, boom, you're going to fall. But how what's, how do you reverse it? You start glorifying Him, worshiping, thanking that's Him, it. focusing that's on right. Him, and the Spirit will keep you in holiness. Oh, man. Man, that's powerful. So we're down to an end. Um, and so thank you, Pastor Rick. Yeah. That was amazing. Uh, we do have live Bible study tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., so make sure and tune in. And you have an awesome day, Pastor Rick. You have an awesome day. I will. Walk in the Spirit. Yes, and you have an awesome day. We'll see you next time. Bye. I'd like to encourage you to come join me on July the 5th through the 8th for our Summer Family Bible Conference. This is always one of the highlights of our year. We have many different speakers. It goes from Monday night through Friday noon. And this year we've got our patriotic musical, uh, In God We Trust, that will be performed on July the 4th. And I tell you, this is powerful. It's just going to be a special time. We've got special ministry for the youth, for young people. It's a great time. So join us on July the 5th through the 8th for our Summer Family Bible Conference. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 